get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Zapier, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And, you know, Alex, I say it's always interesting to hear the story of, you know, like Noah Alper, who created and sold his chain of bagel stores to Einstein's for $100 million in 1995. But what I get off on, what I love is, and what people don't realize is, before that, he was selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk, and the business was a flop, and it failed. And so he had a lot of different, you know, fail points or learning points before he kind of hit on his big thing. And I kind of love to hear the background and challenges. So... Uh, before I introduce you to today's guest, it, it was an amazing story. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, Rise25 and my mission, and Alex and I were talking about it before, is just to connect people, connect people with their best customers, referral partners, whoever it is, um, to help their, their business in life. And we do that in three ways. Formally, you know, we do it informally to people all the time, but formally we have a done-for-you media and content where we help a company completely run and launch their own podcast. We distribute it across 11 different channels, including a dedicated blog post and social media for a lot of content marketing. And the person simply shows up and talks, and we do everything else. Our team has been working with podcasters since 2009. I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life, besides meeting really cool people and nice founders, um, I've made best friends, found my business partner, and it's led to a lot of countless customers and referral partners. Um, the second is our done for you lead generation. We manually send out a consistent outreach message to ideal clients and referral partners or sources for people. This is not paid traffic. We also do done for you events at different conferences and software companies to bring their highest level customers together. Um, I have to mention uh, Sticker Mule as well. Sticker Mule has given me access to an amazing offer, Alex, and they said if it goes viral, they will cancel it, and um, or you'll go to a page and you'll see a dollar off. But the the deal is ten custom stickers for a dollar. Sticker Mule works with Nike, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and basically in like sixty seconds, you can upload your logo and you can get custom stickers, magnets, buttons, and their stickers are very high quality. I figured they'd do that because probably once they get you hooked, you just keep going back for more. So if you go to stickermule.com slash inspired, you can get 10 custom stickers for $1. Um, I'm excited to introduce today's guest who's done some remarkable things um, in AI and IA. We'll talk about what that means. But um, Alex Bates has spent the last decade bringing artificial intelligence and machine learning to the forefront of the industrial market. And in 2016, Alex sold his company, Mtel to Aspen Tech for $38 million. And unlike most tech startups, Alex and his co-founder raised only a million dollars in funding and maintained ownership of the majority of the company. And as part of the acquisition, Alex had to stay with Aspen Tech for two years. Uh, what happened at 5 p.m. on the day his two years was up is he resigned and he's dedicating his life to driving AI tech forward. Um, he does have a book, Augmented Mind, um, AI, Superhumans, and the Next Economic Revolution. You can find it on Amazon. You will be able to find it on Audible, so I'm looking forward to that. And he's an active angel investor, partner in the AI incubator, The Sandbox. You can find out about everything he's doing at um, neocortexventures.com. Dot com and just to show you how intelligent Alex is, I had to read how Mtel was described in my re when I was doing research several times. I'm not sure I fully comprehend it, but um, essentially what it did was it harnesses the deluge of sensor data with the mission of creating a world that doesn't break down. And so basically, Mtel's machine learning platform was used to monitor global fleets of offshore drilling rigs, railroad engines, and process equipment. Um, in effect, creating a you know distributed immune system to protect equipment and personnel. So he's got three patents, and I think he's majored in had seven majors in college. Alex, thanks for joining me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I wanted to talk about 
there's a lot of things I want to talk about, but um, when we were talking beforehand, um, IA versus AI. Okay. Yeah. It, um, so IA intelligence amp augmentation, uh, sometimes called augmented intelligence, but I like IA because it is a flip on the acronym and it's, it, it is a different approach and it's, it's focusing on augmenting human intelligence as opposed to just synthetic external. So how do you or people utilize, um, intelligence, you know, augmentation, IA? Well, it's really interesting. I think a lot of people doing AI and machine learning startups right now, they start with the data, right? And they say, what data do we have? What patterns can we learn? Supervised or unsupervised learning. And, and IA is a fundamentally different approach. It says, let's look at the humans work in the field. Let's look at their work processes and let's try to amplify and augment those. And then also look at the data, but really look at helping people do their job better and harnessing their human centered gifts and skills. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, and we'll go into some of the backstory, but MTEL, how did you come up with MTEL? I'm sure, you know, one day you weren't dreaming up. I want to, you know, help drilling rigs and railroad engines. (laughs) Where'd the idea come from? It was one of those synergistic things. So I was on a camping trip and, um, I, I, a guy on the trip, that I met, he was a mechanical engineer. He'd worked in an industrial liability for decades. I I never thought, oh, I'm going to go in and save oil rigs. Like you say. What do you want to be when you grow up, Alex? (laughs) I want to help oil rigs. And (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it was, uh, you know, I would have never predicted it. Speaking of predictions, but met him, we hit it off. He was, we both were very entrepreneurial minded, but, um, he had a consulting practice that was looking at power plants and, one thing led to another. I was the computer science kind of data scientist and uh, just two minds melded together. That's how it came So about. what was the original idea? Because oftentimes, you know, what it starts off as is never what it ends up as. A hundred percent. Actually, early on, we dabbled in augmented reality way before its time. It wasn't even called that back then, but there were these um, these sort of packs you could wear and a thing that did retinal projection. It was sort of a precursor to Google Glass we dabbled in a picture um, like a superhero what what did that like how did you so you're the you kind of program it and have put the technology behind it and he basically builds it because he's the the engineer industrial engineer or yeah he was involved in some of the um, the hardware and the human factors yeah. and just understanding the industrial work process yeah even dabbled with some military dod stuff but i think um we discovered that the big need was really equipment reliability. What we said mm-hmm. was stopping machines from breaking down because they were causing not just equipment failure and maintenance cost, but killing people. It's huge, environment. huge problems. I want to go back to the jet pack or the pack with the retinal thing for a second because just focusing on something that you know didn't get legs, right? So what was your process there? What was your thought process of the pain point and what you were creating and then how eventually you decided to just stop doing it what was the well, idea original idea with that yeah we we got some prototype hardware and there were some military people interested and some private sector some people at uh, semper energy a local energy company and so we were building these prototypes and there's a lot of interest and um i think it just it's classic economics you know the interest in translate to orders what was it going to be like what was the what was it solving for them it was going to be interactive knowledge management. So someone could, a worker, a maintenance guy could walk around a plant and get a heads up display of sort of augmented reality of, of uh, real time contextual information. It turned out the hardware wasn't ready for it. I mean, this was like 15 years before Google Glass. Just to it's crazy. It yeah. <laughs> there was like no internet at the time. <laughs> yeah. This is like the stone ages. So nothing was really things it, it looked great but there were so many rough edges it just wasn't ready for prime time so some people were interested but the economics didn't work out the economics didn't work out the hardware the companies producing the hardware kind of went out of business eventually because it was just ahead of its time at, at, at that point so at what point again like you pr- how long did you, would you say you worked on that for well i mean we were super excited about it so we probably I, i'd say four to six months on and off right um, and so what was the process? You go out and how did you get in touch with some of these, these people to see if they're interested? Because it's obviously the same process you did for MTEL, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul in the industrial realm had some uh, some contacts at uh, Point Magoo, a military base, and a couple other spots along California. And so there's some of his connections in the industry. We we got these these meetings and would work on the demos behind the scenes. We also worked on there's this technology Adobe Flash, which could make these really immersive, interactive animations, and that was part of our our front end. And Flash was interesting because it, it seemed like it was going to become the next generation web interface, but it turned out that simplicity won. And of course, Apple, I think, was part of the demise of Flash in general. But totally, um, it seemed the most powerful and slick. Ultimately, lost out to simpler competitors. So you had that product. What was what were some of the next iterations before we get to Mtel? We worked on a lot of. Uh, I'd say knowledge knowledge management for maintenance people. So like um, aggregating encyclopedias of maintenance information, of equipment information. And the idea was they could quickly pull up relevant equipment specs or maintenance records or visual diagrams of spare parts. Um, So a lot of work on, we actually joined an open standards consortium and did a lot of work to work on data models for how do you approach equipment taxonomies um, and, and some of that was helpful later on, but ultimately we, we became laser focused on machine learning and the other stuff became peripheral. How do you, Alex, I'm curious, what's your process for these ideas, vetting them? Do you guys have a brainstorming session on, you know, what's your, what's, what was your, both of your process for coming up with the ideas that eventually led to, to MTEL? Because it sounds like I would never in a million years think Let's do a knowledge sourcing of equip. You know, where where do you even come up with this, and then how do you decide what to move forward with? Yeah, great question. I think it was helpful that we had a consulting practice where we were doing interactive uh, reports for power plants that we were pulling sensor data, pulling maintenance records. So I think in consulting, we've gotten access to some of the data sources. That was a helpful leg up, and it also established some relationships. And then joining the this Open Standards Consortium gave us an interesting perspective because you had both vendors and c- customers on the council talking about what data do we need to model. That also gave us a perspective and, and some relationships to help you know drive that. So you guys decide to move forward with MTEL. What was that original version? Well, originally, I think like a lot of software companies, we decided... You can you can code things up relatively quickly. So on our website, we had like six different products. We had uh, risk management. We had asset data modeling. We had all this stuff. And we also had a predictive machine learning that could learn patterns of machine failure. Mm. The problem was we were like five different companies in one. We were just a handful of software developers. And so just because you can code up a feature doesn't mean you can actually support a company and, and the other thing I think we learned was that when when a, when a big company like Chevron looks at a startup, they want to see laser focus. If they see you doing three things, they're going to say there's no way a handful of guys working out of a garage can successfully do these three products. Yeah. So one, and that's what we'll buy. <laughs> so when you go to these meetings with these big companies, how do you approach them? Do you make your company look bigger? You know, because there's one thing if they find out there's like three guys in a garage, there's another like, you know, people also go the opposite uh, and, you know, put just sort of a generic web page up that looks like a corporate web page. How are you approaching these large companies? It, it, we definitely focused on some of the perception aspects because obviously uh, we were a startup and some of these were mission critical systems like drilling rigs. And so we... Right. These are like we, what? They're... I mean, we're talking billions of dollars of investment they've put in over the years. Billions of dollars. I mean, um, and so we, yeah, we, we, we did spend, we found a really good graphic designer. I'd say our website was pretty polished given the size of our company. And then we, we, yeah, we spent some time having like a training. We, we put together a whole training curriculum for our software that I think was probably more sophisticated than some startups. And so when we'd go and do a workshop with a customer, I mean, when they would ask the headcount question, which was always an uncomfortable moment, I think they were usually pretty shocked because usually we got pretty far in the sales cycle before it came up and they'd go, whoa, okay, so now we need to talk about how you're going to support it. <laughs> you're like, it's just me. You're getting me. Like, whoa, that's... What, did that stop the conversation for some people or would they kind of look past it because it, it was far enough in the, in the cycle? 
they usually tended to look past it. Sometimes they'd ask about, okay, well, what's your fundraising strategy or, you know, what, what is your long-term roadmap? And, and we always had pretty thought out answers to that. So I think they were okay with it. We also had, we spent time getting a partner ecosystem. So we found some established services like system integration companies. Mm. We could point to them. We'd be like, look, we have 10 guys, but here's a company with 150 consultants. Yeah. And our software. Like You're that. utilizing these other companies for, for help as, as sort of partners. Yeah, totally. So how are you getting meetings and who is head of sales? Because you're the technical person. The other person is kind of the hardware person. How, you know, it's all these are different skill sets. Yeah, so true. I mean, we didn't hire really dedicated sales till relatively late in the game. Paul was kind of the, um, he was sort of the domain expert for industrial maintenance and reliability. And I was more on the tech side. So we would usually tag team these, these kind of demos and meetings and, we also picked, we had a relationship with a big industrial company called Wonderware at the time. And they were owned by a company called Invensys, which was like a $6 billion conglomerate. Yeah. And as a partner, they helped, uh, they saw us as filling a white space to them. And, and our software indirectly helped promote theirs. So they said, hey, tell you what, you know, we'll let you tag along with some trade shows. We'll let you host some webinars mm. to our customer base. And so that was that was super helpful, both from a credibility and just a customer access perspective. Totally. Um, so you said in the beginning you had whatever it was six different products on there. So how did you decide which to laser focus in on and when? Yeah, we did a lot of soul searching. Actually, we brought in uh, one of our um, one of the guys that joined our management team, uh, Mike Brooks, came over from uh, Chevron's venture capital division, and he was helpful to. He had a good background in product management and just startup strategy. And so he helped us go through a whole brainstorming process to say, what's the most important thing we're doing? And ultimately it distilled down to machine learning, which at the time we thought was just one of you know five or six things that we were doing. Mm. Was Is there a reason you think um, companies like Chevron didn't purchase you? Like any of your customers didn't purchase you? We got into some conversations, not with them, with another customer in the drilling space that, um, you know, uh, it could have worked out. If you look at the economics, um, they were going to consider selling it as an equipment OEM to their customers so they could actually get benefit, not just to protect their equipment, but they could monetize it to their customer base. Uh, but I think ultimately it was a better fit for a, a software company to scale, to really scale it. But um, we did have an early conversation, but it didn't didn't get to the finish line. So. I'm just saying because there's a huge value, whether they sell it or not, there's a huge value to them for having that in-house and not, you know, I mean, they'll pay for it on the front end, but they want to continue to pay for it um, totally, yeah. on that on that end of it. But, um, you know, for t your first big customer, when, when did that happen and, and what was that well, story? Yeah, so I'd say our first big customer, um, Semper Energy here locally, they were, they had been a consulting client when we had our sort of more custom consultancy. And when we launched the software company, Mtel, originally called Intelligence, they agreed to pilot our software. And um, so they were, they were our first significant customer. And, um, and then, you know, we, uh, we added others after them. But so th that process was partly, we had some credibility from our previous relationship. And we cut him obviously a really good deal to get get a first uh, first order. Yeah, um, I know with with any company there's been kind of ups and downs. What what's some of the crazy times in Mtel? Man, we had tons of downs. I mean, I, I I feel like it was such a roller coaster that there were numerous points where we hit low points. You know, we had late payroll. We had some points. We had some times where we had interest in acquiring us and then it never went anywhere or we got all our hopes up. And one of the things that we learned as technical leaders was that we had to modulate those highs and lows. Early on, we just told everyone, and the problem was all your engineers, if they ride that roller coaster, that can be hard to motivate when something doesn't get to the finish line. So, but yeah, we had everything from acquisitions that didn't go through, orders. I mean, when the 2008 downturn hit, we were on the brink of a seven-figure deal, and it was right up for signature at the CIO. And mm. then right, 
the economy tanked and the drilling market tanked. They they put a freeze on all purchase activity. So oh. lots lots of stuff like that. Yeah, we, we hear the success story, but we never hear the kind of the roller coaster that leads up to that. Um, w- was your service heavily affected with? kind of the oil and gas industry or is it they need this regardless of what's going on in the industry we were definitely hit so actually when the price of oil dropped so it was interesting because i think it was sort of tacitly supported by the u.s government that saudi arabia flooded the market with oil and it it essentially what happened is um it brought down the fracking industry and a lot of the, the U.S. drilling industry was became collateral damage. And so drilling, you know, the price of oil per barrel dropped precipitously. I think in essence, though, it it was good in some respects because, you, well, you can look at fracking as a double-edged sword. It, it provided a lot of jobs, but there was some environmental impact. And so a lot of that contracted. Um, some people complained that when the price of oil dropped, there was less focus on solar energy because, hey, we've got cheap oil now. It's just right, you know, totally. Right. And it goes both ways. But we definitely took a hit because some of those those companies in the energy sector pulled back on their spending. And so you get acquired. What is that process like? I mean, it sounded like you had some offers before. What was that process like when it when it finalized or when you had the you know the buyer that ended up take, you know taking over? Um, incredibly stressful right up until the finish line. I think we had PTSD from previous failed acquisitions. Right. And so you can imagine, you know, every little thing you take so seriously. I will say that, you know, from previous ones, it, as much as it, it was sort of a blow to the emotionally, it made us so much stronger because we took time to bring in coaches, improve our sales force, improve our ability to pull reports and financials. And so when we went into due diligence, which was a three-month process. Uh, we were much better prepared than we had been previously, but um, it was incredibly intense negotiation. You'd get a questionnaire with 200 technical questions. You, you fill it out, and you get 500 follow-up questions for your answers. And I mean, this org- this company, Aztec, was incredibly thorough. You know, they'd acquired 30 companies, I think, over the last two or three decades. And so they had a very detailed playbook and script, and um, and so yeah, it was pretty intense. What advice do you have for someone going through an acquisition process? Because I imagine, again, um, from my research, like when you were purchased, you had ten staff and ten contractors, mm-hmm. and it's like a full time job putting all this stuff together. So, what advice do you have for someone going through? an acquisition process like this if you if you knew what you know now well there's a couple things one is a little bit counterintuitive i think normally you want to visualize a goal and focus on it and just try to move towards it i think that's not the case with getting acquired because if you focus on getting acquired you get short timer syndrome and you take your eye off the ball and if they pick up on the fact that you took your eye off the ball it doesn't end well and you know, we experienced that firsthand. So, so you pretend one, like it's not even happening, essentially. Essentially. I mean, you have to pr- you have to essentially suddenly do two full-time jobs. So you can forget about sleep for a while. But you can't give up on on your focus on growing your business, on closing sales. And and they like that. They actually want to see. And they want to see you occasionally push back that because, wow, you got all this customer activity. And we'd love to we're have to push that deadline out by three days because... X, Y, and Z, and they, they want to see that you're really focused on, on growing your business. And uh, and it, it also helps to have some friendly competition. I think we all, we are, we're also considering raising a Series B round of equity. And um, so we, we also had a whole plan of action before that. Yeah. That helped us not get too emotionally attached. And like any negotiation, you know, you, you have to be willing to walk away at certain points and so that, you know, you, you can't get too attached to the outcome. Yeah. And so after all this hard work, with a company acquisition process, what do you do um, after to after the acquisition? Well, it, to celebrate, the, the, fi- the final day was super intense. We started at six a.m. and went all the way to six p.m. We ran through an, an incredibly intense battery of tests where we ran our software, we compiled the code, and we installed it. And made sure all the results were identical from the open source scans and all this kind of thing, and everything checked out and it was great. I think it was pretty emotionally <laughs> grueling, so. By the end of it, I think we went out and you know had some 
had some scotch and uh and then just passed out because we were so exhausted and then the celebrations followed and uh but actually their their hr team was there the next morning at 8 a.m for you know for integration so we we knew that we would go right into that it was like no break sorry (laughs) get back to work and now you don't have control we control you that's right Right? so we didn't take a huge amount of time off but then i we definitely haven't got some celebrations in later um so as i mentioned in the front of the interview the um at two years or right you know at 5 p.m you know the day uh two years when when you were allowed to uh resign you resign what's going through your head then yeah, well, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, Aspen Tech, they spun out of MIT in the 80s. Probably the most chemical engineering PhDs of any company on the planet would be my guess. Um, really, really smart senior technical leadership. A lot of the original technology leaders were still there. So learned a huge amount from them and, and really um, had a lot of, I guess, vested interest in the long-term success. But I think I was also um, transitioning from a startup to a big publicly traded company where you go from being a decision maker to an influencer and you say, well, you know, I'd go to a meeting and say, well, there's X, Y, and Z, so I think what we need to do is, is this. And they'd say, thanks for your input. And I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, you go from, you're used to like making rapid decisions and moving on. And, and so I, I think um, I knew that it wouldn't be a permanent fit, but I, I, I at the same time wanted to help him as best I could. Mm-hmm. And I was also ready, I think, to move on to some new, uh, some new areas. Yeah. So at that point, what were you thinking you were going to do? Well, I, um, I, I had started writing, you know, I, I had started writing this book during those last two years of, of full-time employment. And so I, I was interested in this next chapter of, of the next evolution of AI and humans and AI collaborating together. And I also knew I wanted to invest and incubate some new AI startups. Um, and the third thing was I formed this AI mastermind group of other like-minded people. So anything interesting that you've seen or that you have that are in your per- portfolio for the uh, AI startups yet? Yeah, well, so this mastermind group, we meet once a month and talk about like paths to artificial general intelligence or su- super intelligence. And there's some interesting kind of early stage discussions going on there and some technology approaches. Uh, from a tangible startup perspective, um, in the sandbox right now, we have, I think, five or six companies officially committed. Uh, one is called Deep Dive Bio, which is uh, machine learning for synthetic biology. Hmm. So that's that's one of our ventures. And so what does one, that do? Is it like a 3D printing type of thing? or? Yeah, it's it's a hardware software kind of play where it can optimize. It can look at all the data involved in what they call DNA printing, you know, where you're synthesizing, you're putting oligos together and synthesizing longer strands of DNA and then optimizing that process. So, yeah, mm. that's basically Yeah. So how far are we, you think, from 3D printing organs for transplants? I it, When I first heard of 3D printing or printing cells and or, organs, it seemed like science fiction. But right now, I think the main challenge for DNA, it's to printing long strands is very challenging. There's a high error rate. So yeah. Um, I think that has to be corrected. We're pretty uh, far away, you're thinking. There's still still some challenges, but maybe one or two breakthroughs away. Okay. So deep dive by what else? What else is uh, interesting in the sandbox? And and another one we have uh, Music Maven. We're applying machine learning to uh, actually to the music industry to help uh, help artists understand how to optimize their trajectory, their, their career, um, and understand the recipe for why things go viral, like why music catches on, mm. certain certain types of genres and that kind of thing. How does that work? Well, we're able to scrape a lot of the different music APIs and look at engagement and look at almost like case studies for why certain artists and songs take off and why certain ones don't and just understand what those recipes are. So that's kind of... That's interesting. Topic. Yeah, I interviewed um, Nancy Duarte. I don't know if you're familiar with her work and um, storytelling. Yeah. And 
it was interesting, and I can't remember the exactly. I, I think she's the one who presented on it, but she overlaid like Martin Luther King's speech with Steve Jobs's speech with all these different speeches to see where the commonalities were of their cadence and and everything like that. So it sounds something like similar. To, I mean, she doesn't have like a, a machine learning piece to that, but something similar of overlaying all of these pieces to see what makes it so powerful, essentially. Yeah, I'll have to look look her up. That sounds really interesting. Um, so music, Maven. What else? Um, aside from that, we've. I mean, I've made some How other. How many angels. companies, Alex, does it take? To, I mean, you probably have sifted through hundreds of companies to get to just a few, right? Yeah, we've we've probably been through over a hundred at this point, and some aren't a fit just because of our 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 strength is sort of B2B enterprise software. We're not really, we don't know much about consumer, so we tend to stay away from those companies just because we don't have as much to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've, we've been through quite a bit. Usually the fit, there's a lot of intangibles. We look for entrepreneurs that are open to coaching and we think would be a good fit with our network of mentors. And then the other part is we make sure we have enough value to add to them and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, what else do you look for? We look for, I mean, on the, the, the data machine learning side, we look for, we like vertical focus plays where you're going into an industry which maybe hasn't been disrupted as much by machine learning. There's going to be some data challenges, which we actually like in terms of barriers to entry. Um, of course, we want to make sure those are solvable data challenges. And uh, and yeah, we then we look to see is, is there is there a real machine learning opponent? Of course, the terms AI and machine learning are being used a lot. And totally, make people sure throw it in there because it sounds good. Totally, yeah. So you know, we we try to assess and screen for that as well. How early would someone be to qualify for for years? Because I well, imagine it, people come in pre-revenue. People come in with kind of a half-baked idea. People maybe have revenue and a fully baked idea. Yeah, totally. So there, uh, you. It, we originally we were going to require a customer. We don't require even having your first customer yet, so mm. you can be revenue. But it's usually not designed for companies just with an idea. It's more. You started working on it. You have a prototype, but now it's sort of part of in between an incubator and accelerator. You want to really now take your business and commercialize it. That kind of thing. What do you look for as far as the team goes? Like, could it be one person, founders? Yeah, we've had everything from one person. It, it most of them have been at least co-founders or a small team. I, I think that you know statistically more than one founder you're more likely to succeed but that's not a hard requirement for us you know if if it is a team we like to see that they ideally knew each other before they went into the company together because um it's like a marriage I, it's like a marriage yeah, yeah i mean Bill talks about that too but i think it's a good point because the the uh, chemistry can be so explosive and, and often when companies break up it's more because of founder conflict sometimes than other things what about technical wise? Does someone need to be? Because I know you're very technical, right? So do you, does some, one of the founders or a founder have to be very technical or no? We like to see at least one super technical person. If they don't have it, we would try to plug someone in. But I'll, uh, that that is a pretty strong criteria that they either have or have someone re immediately ready to recruit to fill that. What made you write the book, Augmented Mind? The book, so I formed. I actually formed this mastermind group about a year before I wrote the book, and we'd meet once a month and we would talk about the path to super intelligence. and And it was interesting because all of us had been in the field for decades, and some people had done more pure research, but almost everyone had done at least one startup company. A lot of them had sold their companies, and the interesting perspective that emerged was we talked about some areas we have progress, and other areas we don't. But we were also talked about the roles of humans and are we going to become obsolete and just, you know, disappear in the blink of an eye and be taken over by artificial intelligence. And one thread that emerged was that there was not a lot of focus on augmenting human intelligence. It was mostly just on creating replacing replacing. Yeah. And and so that led me to write the book was that I I. I tested it in my mastermind group and then I started doing more interviews and discovered that it, it wasn't really getting as much attention as I thought it should. So where do you think it will uh, manifest aug augmenting human intelligence? Well, I think in technology, um, you mentioned people like Steve Jobs, the vision that we set really drives 
what we build towards. And, and the vision that I tended to hear from some of the real leaders, at least in the investment community, like Vinod Kosla and some of these others that are pumping billions of dollars into investing in AI startups, for example, most of their vision was that, you know, humans will be surpassed maybe in a decade or two. So let's just enjoy our time here before we become obsolete. And and, and to me, that was concerning. Cause if that's <laughs> it, and that's what you're funding. Right. Then, you know, that's what you're going to end up with. Yeah, I'm just curious where it manifests. Like, for instance, like augmented human intelligence, maybe... I don't know where you see it, maybe in like a surgery or something where it just is smart and it can find it, but ultimately the human will execute on some piece of that surgery. I don't know. Are there certain industries or specific tasks that you see it lends itself to more than others? Like in yeah. a tangible, like in a tangible example. Well, humans, there's certain areas where our gifts are, are totally you know, where synthetic eyes nowhere near catching up to us and some domains like creativity and intuition, there are very limited forms of that mm. in, in networks with things like generative adversarial networks where they're able to generate certain types of things, but it's, it's extremely limited. And so humans still have these, we're also really good at um, knowing it, what I'd call a dynamic pattern recognition. Like machine learning can learn a static pattern and detect it completely consistently, but our world is constantly changing and we're able to adapt and detect when patterns no longer apply or like when black swan events, we can react to them. And a lot of machine learning, unless it's been fed data and seen it before, it's not going to know how to react. And so I think there's a really useful role for our types of cognition. And, and we developed this embodied cognition picture by grown up as infants interacting with the world. And, and even social interactions, which we're very social animals. And, uh, and so I think there's important ways to incorporate all that. So, you know, for instance, um, in the drilling rigs that you guys worked with, I think you had mentioned when I was doing some research that there were times when the humans would detect something that the software wouldn't based off of some kind of pattern. What was an example of that where the humans would, I mean, quote unquote, like outsmart the the AI. Yeah, totally. The, I mean, the AI and machine learning can detect completely consistent, rigorous patterns, for example, of a bearing failure. But what it often didn't, and sometimes it just didn't have data, but they, let's say a new operator came on a rig and was operating it slightly differently and it tripped an anomaly. And they know, oh, well, yeah, that was on the first shift and a new, a new operator was there, hadn't been trained properly. Or in some case, um, there could be some environmental thing where depending on the season, there's certain factors and we didn't always have data for those seasonal factors to mm. incorporate hey, if it's winter and it's this temperature gradient, you know, and so some of it might be a lack of data, but the humans after spending a decade or two develop this incredible intuition and we could generate a prediction and with their intuition, they could quickly sort of screen it and say, Oh, no, they could explain it away a lot of the time if it's an anomaly. And when they couldn't explain it, of course, then we'd, we'd delve in and yeah. investigate. So you think, I mean, part of it is that a human's intuition, part of it maybe is over if the machine had 10 years of data, it may start to detect those things anyways. Well, we did have often a decade of data. Oh, okay. When you get into like environmental and textual factors, it's actually difficult to get structured data because you have to model like, season of year, temperature, there's so many different types of contextual variables that right. really you could feed more and more of them in. But even then, machine learning, when you feed too many variables, it starts to struggle. So they're just, we, we have this great ability to take in tons of variables, but quickly hone in on the ones that are relevant. How far, Alex, do you think we're away from everyone having self-driving cars or something like that? I think of that because when someone was explaining, you know, whatever the Tesla self-driving car, they're saying, well, it, it stopped suddenly. The driver's like, why is it stopping? But it was detecting like three cars in front of it slowing down, which a human would never be able to detect. But the, you know, whatever the lasers on the car detected. Um, so it just makes me think, you know, sometimes they're a little bit, they're just gathering more data than we could even possibly gather. How far off do you think we are from, from that? With the technology, you know, that that's an area where I think humans need to hurry up and relinquish control because we've all been on freeways and 
I mean, we get distracted, but we're really where we're not good at is doing a monotonous activity for hundreds of hours on end without getting distracted. That's not one of our gifts. And, and that's actually where computers shine. So I think the sooner the better. There's tons and tons of edge cases. For, you know, I drive a Tesla and I did have one where I thought I had a false braking event, right? Like it braked. But then I was passing this car in a turn lane. And after I passed them, they changed into my lane. So I think it must have detected a microscopic shift where mm. they were moving toward me. And so maybe, it, you know, maybe it was correct. But yeah, I mean, they have to solve a lot of those messy. The other challenge, I think, is um, when you're turning a lane, when you're changing a lane, let's say some cities are more aggressive than others where you have to. It's like a challenge response. You have to drift over and hope the car slows down. And if they don't, you drift back and that varies city to city in terms of how aggressive people like in drive. chicago new york right <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, they won't stop for pedestrians yeah oh man Hope, so is, is your is your car is it highway to like on ramp off ramp does it have the self-driving component yeah. yeah it's i haven't um i haven't used that feature yet they claim the newest software release it, it can actually go on ramp to off ramp uh, but yeah, I, I love it. I manage it all the time. I know there's a few rough edges that I avoid, but knowing what those are, it works great. What what do you where do you think that the AI machine learning um, or IA will make humans obsolete? Well, okay, definitely anything with there, there's this chart they do where there's an axis of precision grasping activity with a lot of irregularity to it. Um, and right now precision grasping humans still do like putting things in small boxes or, you know, even right. like early on the manufacturing, right. People used to like do everything and now, you know, that's probably made humans obsolete. Yeah. So like low precision menial activities, of course, will get obsolete by robotics. And then there's a social axis. So things that don't require a lot of social interaction are probably at higher, higher risk in general. But, then there's things like doctors, where doctors, just like people on a drilling rig, there's there's the data and the symptoms, but we're we're social animals, so they'll, they'll ask some psychological questions about your stress levels, and you can't always just get clean data from that. And they also read your body language, and and effective computing, I think, is still a ways off because they can read facial expressions, but body language is still tough. And so, it, so I think the more social interaction is is safe, and then and then things with a lot of creativity and intuition. But yeah, things with more menial, repetitive work, um, probably probably high risk. Is there anything, like an opinion you hold that would blow people's mind as far as, no, that's not going to happen? Like, you know, some people think, you know, I've, I've interviewed some people like in the health and longevity field that believe, they fully believe, like, we'll live forever. Um, and there's certain people in the, the technology field, like, you know, um, that we will never drive cars that, that will just, they'll just pick us up and drop us off. Is there a certain belief you hold that would surprise people that you know or, or anyone else that you think, oh, this is going to vanish because of X, Y, Z? Yeah, I would say one definite one is I do genuinely believe we're about to become superhuman. And what I mean by that is we're going to, augment and amplify our our intelligence creativity and even our, our emotional intelligence to superhuman levels and to me that's incredibly exciting and it will actually make a lot of our current economic model obsolete and mm. I, I don't think a lot of people seem to appreciate that or, or believe in that so what do you mean economic model obsolete how would that how would that manifest well i think a lot of our economics right now are very zero sum oriented and we, it's it's always oriented around scarce resources, competition, and and actually Peter Thiel in his book Zero to One talks about the best companies actually don't have a lot of competition, and I actually think that in this next realm where we become superhuman intelligence, it'll become so much of a positive sum game that just like Peter Thiel points out, we'll we'll all find things that we're interested in and pursue them and it won't be so oriented towards competing for energy and scarce resources and i think we'll probably become less obsessed with that than, than we are now yeah i mean that's in your book you know ai superhumans the next economic revolution right um so 
how does that happen? How will someone, when you say superhuman, what does that mean to you? Well, right now, I think we're very imperfect machines. We're, we go through these highs and lows of motivation. There's some new research coming out on flow state and, and how we very rarely are in flow state. And it's just amazing when we are, like, what we can accomplish. And so thinking ahead, if we could spend a lot more of our time in this sort of flow state, whatever our passion and gifts are, maybe it's engineering, maybe it's art or design, and, and we could accomplish so much more of what actually we're passionate about. And so, so I, I, I see that happening. I think economically it'll be a little bit of a rocky road because getting to a post-scarcity era, there's going to be some things left to figure out and sort through. So I, I'm not saying it's going to be this you know, easy overnight transition, right. but I think, I think it'll be pretty amazing once we get through it. So Alex, what do you do to optimize or increase your flow state or i'm sure you have like regiments of i don't know food diet whatever else what what kind of what kind of interesting kind of habits have you put in place yeah well a lot of how i approach some of the projects i work on now which are, are a lot of them are just pet projects is how can i augment myself or areas everything from communication email uh, my calendar any inefficiencies with with technology to and 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 another example is they, there's this book called the paradox of choice where humans actually like freedom but we don't like too much freedom we don't want to make too many choices or decisions and so if i could have an ai that figured out what i liked and made all the menial decisions day by day i could just focus on the small number of decisions that that i want to focus on you know like i say steve jobs doesn't even he would wear the same outfit every totally. day, right? So small stuff like that actually magnifies over time. So I'm trying to augment myself with AI to offload as much of the manual stuff as possible. So, and and you also are involved in, in Peter Diamandis' group, right? The Abundance 360. What have you learned from from Peter and the people in, in that group? Yeah, so there, there's the upcoming uh, Abundance 360 event here coming up late January in a couple of weeks. And so, but Peter... He's a technology visionary, and I think he's one of the people. His books like Bold and some of the other Abundance book. Totally. Um, he sets a really clear vision of what I see as a post scarcity era that we have coming up. And um, so I've learned just part of it is from an inspiration perspective, but also practically with the X Prize Foundation and with some of the other groups he's put together, like Singularity University. Uh, building networks of people that are helping manifest some of these transformational technologies. Who do you look at also as a leader in this space, like Peter Diamandis? Peter Diamandis, Peter Thiel is another where he's more of a behind the scenes guy, you know, PayPal co founder. Yeah. Not as well known, but kind of the mafia don of Silicon Valley, but he uh, he funds a lot of really interesting things, even like seasteading where they're exploring artificial nation state islands that like modular islands explore some of these kinds of concepts so i see he's a, he's a visionary on a m multiple levels and of course elon musk for pushing forward with multi-planetary and energy and all that kind of thing yeah um so the what is one of your favorite parts of the book or favorite story from the book augmented mind let's see the um one one of the fun areas to write which i actually learned a lot of surprising information because I, I went back and did a lot of research on neuroscience and, and did some interviews. The section I wrote on what makes humans special because hmm. I went on what makes AI special and what its strengths are and then went on what makes humans special and I was really um, surprised and intrigued by what I learned about how we have these epiphanies or eureka moments and there's some amazing new neuroscience that's come out um, that where they've used fMRIs and they can look at some of the networks and it turns out there's two different neural networks that work in tandem when we have these epiphanies and one's called the default mode network one's called the central executive but when you have an epiphany and it almost feels like something from the beyond like from another world this this idea jumps into your head and they've now have some interesting ideas of how those two networks interact and when it like default mode network passes it up to the central executive and hmm. you have your and that was fascinating to me and and again a thing where it's ai is still doesn't even approach things that way 
Is there anything on how we can have more epiphanies <laughs> or more just how they work in the neuroscience behind it? Yeah, I think a little bit of practical. I mean, I, I'd say one is they tend to come about during these moments of flow state or what they call like directed wandering. You have to give yourself more time for sort of daydreaming, if you will. And most of us give ourselves no time for it's that. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Right? Like, the, if you're hard charging, and you're like, I just need to put my nose to the grindstone to get it done, then it probably is, is more likely not going to happen, it sounds like. Really counterintuitive. It's like, you can actually be too disciplined and maybe shut down that creative epiphany machine that you have. And so, if, you know, if we, my, my hope is if we can offload the menial tasks, then we should have more time for some of that uh, just sort of epiphany but the, also just to, um, the other interesting part was you do have to first put in the hard work of becoming an expert so you don't have an epiphany until you've spent however many years really getting deep into one domain and then you can have an epiphany that can change the whole field. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, I have two last questions, but everyone should check out, where should we point people towards to check out? I mean, I know you have Neocortex Ventures um, and I know you have the book. Um where should we point people towards to find out more? Well, I, I have one combined website called alexbates.ai where okay. I, I link to all the different kind of um, projects and companies I'm involved in. So that, that's one resource. Um, and yeah, then the book, um, there's a website, augmentedmind.com. But uh, yeah, that, that, the main one would probably be alexbates.ai. alexbates.ai. Okay, great. Everyone check out alexbates.ai. Um, Alex, I always like to ask because uh, it's inspired insider what has been you know a low moment that you had to kind of push through um and then on the flip side what's been a proud moment what's been a tough time yeah tough time one would would definitely be when uh one of the moments where we had a company come and approach us about acquiring our company and get what we thought was close to the finish line and had the whole thing fall through and pull the plug uh, that was one of those moments where we all came close to just folding up shop. We're like, this is it. There's no way we'll come back from this. But ultimately, we did two years later. But um, yes, yeah, so that'd be a low point. At that and then point, I, when you, you're you at that point, you're like, let's fold everything up. What I mean, you could have folded things up at that point. What do you think at that point caused you um, to not give up and just stop? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I think, well, one is I was just, I was super passionate about both the technology of, of neural networks. I always, I saw the promise of it. And then also our mission of creating a world that doesn't break down. I saw it as, and I, I think um, it was a combination of just, and, and maybe also just tenacity and persistence. Like I was like, we're not going to let them, we're not going to let yeah. them shut us down. You know, they, they didn't move forward, but someone else will. So it was a little bit of refusing it's like to a just stubbornness. Stubbornness, I guess. Yeah. So many, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, um, when I was reading about some of the things you were, you know, growing up, it sounded like you had to kind of fight for your time on the computer, right? That's right. Yeah. How many siblings did you have? Well, two siblings. So my brother was my chief competitor for time on the one family computer at right. the time. So. Yeah, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of battles for that. And then um, I don't know if this is accurate, but I think I read like you had to move six times in elementary school to different places. That's right. Yeah, lots of different cities and across both coasts. So how did that? How do you think that affected you? I mean, because then you you sort of have to adapt quickly, and you you sort of have to just I don't know make do. But at the time, were you even thinking that or? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of it's a very dynamic. You know, every one to two years, you're moving into school, trying to make new friends, and I think it it actually made me a lot more adaptable to new cities and just new experiences. And um, you know, some of my friends that grew up in Portland and never moved, they're they're still in Portland, whereas I think I, I had a much more a perspective about embracing change in some respects. Yeah. So on the flip side, um, a proud moment, especially a proud moment. A proud moment. Um, one was actually um, finishing the book itself because 
I embarked on that project, and I think I underestimated how much work it was. I, I figured you just you're um, like you can code up an oil rig for AI in like a day, but then writing book after two years. <laughs> oh man, it was uh, it was a lot of work, and it's a lot more than narrating into your iPhone. I can I can tell you that much. So I think I, I went through periods of like fatigue where I would yeah I'd probably get burned out a few times, and I'd be laying on the couch like just trying to type like a keystroke at a time and I could barely have enough energy to like hit a keystroke. But once I, once I finally finished it, um, and got, you know, went through my editorial reviews, um, it was just such a, such a release. So that was, that was definitely a, a proud moment. And now people can find it on Amazon and, um, it will be an audible, it will be an audiobook as well. That's right. It's kind of like digital pre-release form, and the official publication will be um, coming up in April. Yeah, cool. Alex, thank you so much. I want to be the first one to thank you. I mean, I just love hearing your perspective and thoughts because um, you do have a lot of, a lot of data at your fingertips and also just have a lot of interesting ideas on, on the future. So everyone should check out alexbates.ai and um, check out what he's doing. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having yeah. me. Really Between my eyes, walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.